For two decades following Marilyn Monroe's death, Joe DiMaggio continued to send roses to her grave. While many perceived this as a romantic gesture, the reality was much darker. Why that is, find out more later. The allure of the blonde bombshell Marilyn Monroe, the quintessential Hollywood figure, is a tale of equal parts glamour and tragedy. Born Norma Jane Mortensen in 1926, her early life was marked by a tumultuous upbringing before she skyrocketed into the world of pinup modeling and eventually Hollywood. Despite a relatively brief acting career spanning about a decade, Monroe achieved unparalleled fame, only to meet an untimely demise at the age of 36. On June 1, 1926, Marilyn Monroe, initially named Norma Jean, entered the world with a scandalous touch. Her mother, Gladys Mortensen, had already gone through one divorce and separated from another husband before conceiving Norma, rendering the child illegitimate. Despite the absence of her father, Monroe found little solace in her mother Gladys, who struggled to cope with the challenges of single motherhood. Facing financial difficulties and grappling with mental health issues, Gladys, unable to handle the responsibilities of a newborn, eventually placed Monroe in foster care. During her early years, Monroe lived with the Bollander family, an evangelical Christian household, while her mother worked odd jobs in Hollywood. Gladys made genuine efforts, utilizing assistance programs to buy a home and taking on the role of a landlady alongside other jobs. Unfortunately, like her famous daughter, Gladys battled severe mental health problems. Gladys's grief took a distressing turn as she resented Monroe for surviving while her brother had passed away. Because of this, Monroe experienced periods of neglect in an orphanage and cycled through 12 sets of foster parents, facing various forms of abuse. The traumatic incident with her first foster family at the age of 10 deeply affected her, leading to declining academic performances and the development of a severe stutter. Monroe continued to move through the foster system, encountering abuse in different homes, and at 16, she faced another upheaval as her current foster family needed to relocate without her. Faced with a difficult choice, Monroe had to decide between returning to an orphanage or embarking on an independent journey. Marilyn resolved to leave behind her life as a foster child, opting to capitalize on her attractive appearance. She upgraded her status by becoming a wife. On June 19, 1942, she tied the knot with James Dougherty, her neighbor's son, to avoid returning to an orphanage following her foster family's departure from the state. This proved to be a significant sacrifice and unfortunately, it didn't lead to a long-term fulfillment. She accompanied her marine husband to Catalina Island. While she was there, Monroe took on a role on an assembly line at a munitions factory. It was during one of her shifts as she captured the attention of a visiting photographer, tasked with capturing morale-boosting pictures of the appealing young woman contributing to the war effort. Although Monroe's photographs weren't utilized, the encounter ignited a passion within her. She was determined that she didn't want to languish in Catalina with a lackluster husband. Instead, she embarked on a journey to become a model. In 1945, she parted ways with her first husband and initiated her career as a pinup girl. In 1946, Monroe actively pursued a career as a model with aspirations for fame and fortune. Amidst the difficulties, Monroe's dedication to her professional path proved to be the most demanding. Despite her innate beauty, she became fixated on her appearance. She engaged in exercise routines to shed some of her baby fat and notably transitioned her auburn hair to a blonde hue. With her glamorous transformation nearly finalized, Monroe embarked on her journey into Hollywood. Soon, she secured minor roles such as a secretary and an extra at Square Dance in small-scale films. Adding to the setbacks, some of her scenes in one of her early movies ended up on the cutting room floor. According to Charlie Chaplin's autobiography, though, during breaks from her minor roles, Marilyn Monroe was romantically involved with his son, Charlie Jr., throughout 1947. However, it seemed that Marilyn had inherited her mother's penchant for toxic love affairs. Chaplin asserted that Marilyn's relationship with his son abruptly terminated when Charlie Jr. discovered her in bed with another man, Chaplin's own brother, Sidney. Even more scandalous, certain sources reported that she also engaged in a less than savory relationship with a 69-year-old chairman of the 20th Century Fox in 1948. He agreed to grant her a contract under a sinister condition. She was obligated to come over and provide services whenever he called. The mistreatment of up-and-coming actresses in old Hollywood is sadly nothing new, and most definitely didn't stop there. In order to renew her contract at Columbia, another studio executive attempted to coerce Marilyn into accepting a similar arrangement. When she refused, the studio promptly opted not to extend her time in front of the camera for another six months. It wasn't until 1948 that Marilyn Monroe began to experience success in Hollywood. She starred in the hit musical romance, Ladies of the Chorus,
alongside the renowned actress Adele Jurgens. The two actresses had a great rapport, possibly because they shared similar tastes in men. Adele's boyfriend at the time, Milton Berle, later claimed to have had a brief affair with Monroe while on set. Despite her beauty and newfound status as one of Hollywood's rising stars, after years of modeling and minor roles in films, she still found herself financially strained. In a desperate move, Monroe agreed to pose for nude photographs, a decision that would later come back to haunt her. In 1950, Monroe fully committed to achieving fame. Under the guidance of her agent, she underwent alterations to her front teeth and began using hormone creams to lighten her already fair skin. Additionally, she opted for two painful plastic surgeries, including a tip rhinoplasty to refine her nose and the insertion of a chin implant to change the shape of her face. Such unrealistic beauty standards on women even then. One of Monroe's notably early film roles was as Ms. Caswell in All About Eve. While audiences loved her, Monroe's experience on set was stressful. She battled intense nervousness and would over-prepare for scenes, only to blank on her lines during shooting, requiring multiple takes. Monroe's insecurity and vulnerability made her irresistible to a male co-star, causing drama on set as his wife, Jaja Gabor, kept a close eye on Monroe to ensure she wasn't stealing her husband away. During her early days in Hollywood, Monroe worked tirelessly, appearing in 60 movies in just four years. The demanding schedule took a toll on her, leading to mental instability. Before auditioning for another film, she confided in her acting coach about hearing voices in her head, but sadly, no one ever took her seriously. In 1950, Monroe suffered another personal blow when her agent and boyfriend, Johnny Hyde, passed away suddenly from a heart attack. Devastated, Monroe described losing Hyde as losing her greatest friend. Amidst her grief, she had a disturbing incident where she was found unconscious in her apartment with 30 sleeping pills in her mouth, although she had not ingested enough to harm herself just yet. The fighter that she is, she bounced back. Monroe was on the brink of stardom with her lead role in Clash by Night. However, everything derailed when Rich K photos from 1949 were leaked, causing immediate frenzy. Instead of being celebrated for her acting talent, Monroe became famous overnight as a seductive screen siren. Embracing her new image, she responded to a reporter's question about her revealing photos with wit, cleverly quipping, No, that's not true. I had the radio on. Still, it was no surprise that despite her skyrocketing career, Monroe's personal life was in a tailspin during this period. In 1952, after years of enduring incurable endometriosis, Monroe's pain became so unbearable that she had to undergo surgery. This was already a daunting prospect, made even worse for Monroe, who was desperate to have children. In a last-ditch plea to her doctor, she taped a note to her stomach, imploring him not to remove her ovaries during the procedure. While Monroe grappled with health issues and family drama, the public perceived her as the latest swoon-worthy movie star. In 1953, Marilyn starred in three hit movies, officially cementing her place in Hollywood's A-list. However, despite her success, she wasn't reaping the financial rewards. In Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, somehow Monroe only earned 10% of her co-star Jane Russell's salary. To top that off, the studios wanted Monroe to be their new blonde bombshell. But in the 1950s, this was often code for act like a dumb blonde. Monroe detested being typecast as a ditz because, in reality, she was highly intelligent with an IQ of 168 and spent most of her free time reading. Marilyn recognized that to become a star, she had to play along. While she embraced her new image as a breathy sex symbol, she occasionally let her true feelings be known. As seen in a tart line from Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, I can be smart when it's important, but most men don't like it. During this time, Monroe developed a less than favorable reputation around the studio lots. Even though she was well-liked, she proved challenging to work with. To add to that, if her coach didn't approve of Monroe's performance, she would demand reshoots up to 40 times. Amidst all this drama, Marilyn was busy in the romance department too. After her agent arranged a blind date with baseball player Joe DiMaggio, Monroe fell fast and hard for the athlete. On January 14, 1954, they headed to City Hall and tied the knot. Although they enjoyed a happy honeymoon, the couple soon discovered that they were a huge mismatch. DiMaggio, a homeboy, clashed with Monroe who liked attending classes and staying busy and being around people. Their fundamental differences combined with hectic schedules strained their new marriage. The breaking point came when DiMaggio began interfering with Monroe's films, objecting to her highly sexualized roles and even refusing to allow her to act in certain movies and controlling aspects of her life. While filming The Seven Year Itch, Monroe had a famous scene where she wore a white dress on top of a subway gate. As the train rushed by, the air lifted her skirt, creating an iconic moment in cinema history.
Since the crew shot the scene on a busy New York street, a crowd assembled and men cheered as Monroe revealed her legs and hips. Onlookers were delighted, but Joe DiMaggio was so incensed that he could barely articulate his anger, spluttering out, what the hell is going on here? After Monroe completed the shoot, the couple returned to their nearby hotel room and immediately engaged in a heated argument so loud that it disturbed their neighbors. When Monroe appeared on set the next morning, her arms bore visible bruises. So it was no surprise to anyone that after a mere nine months of marriage to Joe DiMaggio, Monroe decided to end their relationship. When she filed for divorce, the reason she stated was mental cruelty. Announcing the split to her adoring public, Monroe appeared visibly distraught, shedding tears in front of the crowd that had gathered to hear her speak. On the other hand, Joe DiMaggio and his love, or should I say obsession with Marilyn, did not want their marriage to end. Following their divorce, DiMaggio began stalking Monroe, even donning disguises and waiting in hotel lobbies to keep tabs on his ex-wife. His obsession escalated when he tapped Monroe's phones and made unannounced visits to her residence, checking if she was in the company of other men. While DiMaggio continued his unwarranted pursuit of Monroe, Marilyn engaged herself in more enjoyable activities. Rumors circulated that she rebounded by dating Hollywood's hottest young actor of that time, none other than Marlon Brando. In the same year, Monroe stood up against discrimination. When segregation laws prevented jazz singer Ella Fitzgerald from performing at Los Angeles nightclubs, Marilyn took proactive measures to support Fitzgerald. She declared that if the management allowed her to perform, she would personally sit in the front row for a week. This strategy worked, garnering Fitzgerald and the club significant publicity. Her good deeds like these were often overlooked because of her blonde image, and it didn't help that in 1956, just a year after divorcing Joe DiMaggio, Marilyn embarked on her third marriage. Their groom was none other than playwright Arthur Miller, a surprising choice that took everyone by surprise, akin to the nerd marrying the prom queen in old Hollywood terms. Though he was widely perceived as the luckiest man in the world for marrying Hollywood's most desirable woman, Arthur Miller held a starkly different opinion about his marriage to Marilyn Monroe. He quickly regretted their union, documenting disparaging remarks about Monroe in his journal, describing her as disappointing, clingy, unpredictable, and embarrassing. Monroe unfortunately stumbled upon Miller's candid journal entries, and the revelation of his true thoughts left her heartbroken. To make matters worse, some sources suggest that Miller deliberately left the journal open to that specific page, intending for Monroe to discover his unfiltered feelings about her. During this period, Monroe persisted in her acting career, filming The Prince and the Showgirl. Her distress over the failing marriage manifested on set, with her costumes needing multiple sizes due to significant weight fluctuations. Monroe's ever-changing waistline even earned her costume designer's ire, causing tension with the most crucial figure on set, her co-star and director, Sir Lawrence Olivier. Monroe and Olivier clashed frequently. From his perspective, Monroe was consistently tardy and struggled to remember her lines, while Monroe found Olivier cold and judgmental. One day, his frustration led him to exclaim, just be sexy, dealing a blow to Monroe, who aspired to be recognized as a genuine actress rather than a mere stereotype. Monroe's onset experiences were further complicated by developments in her personal life. Between 1956 and 1958, she and Arthur Miller experienced three pregnancies, resulting in two miscarriages and one ectopic pregnancy. Following the third failed pregnancy, Monroe officially abandoned the pursuit of having a child, an immense loss for someone who had always dreamed of motherhood. Absurdly, this was a win for those who worshipped her and cannot stand the thought of her being a mother because of her sexy image. Despite being stereotyped, Monroe maintained her kind-hearted nature. While working on her upcoming film, Let's Make Love, she overheard a distressed crew member worrying about financing his wife's funeral. Swiftly and anonymously, Monroe arranged to provide him with $1,000, allowing him to mourn his wife without the burden of financial concerns. By this time, Monroe's marriage to Arthur Miller was disintegrating. Feeling isolated, emotionally unstable, and unloved, it's unsurprising that Monroe found solace in an affair with her married co-star, Eve Montan. Adding to the scandal, some sources claim Monroe became pregnant with Montan's child. Unfortunately, like her previous pregnancies, this one did not culminate in childbirth, further breaking her heart. Monroe then just put her focus on work, but as with everything else, it's not without controversies. From the outset, The Misfits was a disaster in the making. The director, John Huston, grappled with severe alcoholism, often arriving on set already intoxicated. Two of the stars, Marilyn Monroe and Montgomery Clift, struggled with mental health issues, relying on copious pills to navigate their days. To complicate matters further, the film's writer was Arthur Miller.
amplifying the strain on a profoundly unhappy married couple forced to spend extensive time together. Predictably, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Miller had initially written The Misfits in hopes that working together would mend his relationship with Monroe. Instead, the filming process irreparably shattered their union. Mere weeks later, after shooting commenced, Miller and Monroe ceased sharing a room and eventually refused to communicate directly, resorting to intermediaries, such as Monroe's acting coach when absolutely necessary. While Monroe may have engaged in an affair during her last movie, she refrained from flaunting it before her husband. However, during the filming of The Misfits, she endured the most painful experience of witnessing her husband develop a romance with a photographer, Inge Morath. This wasn't Miller's only affront to his estranged wife. According to certain accounts, Miller inflicted further misery on Monroe through a callous betrayal. Allegedly, he exploited her insecurities and anxiety by delaying the delivery of revised scripts until the last possible moment. Struggling with the line memorization, Monroe found this tactic particularly distressing. Without ample preparation time, she would panic and become deeply distraught. Vulnerable at this juncture, Monroe's mental state deteriorated during the production of The Misfits. She confided in her psychiatrist as she was hearing disembodied voices, exacerbating her already fragile condition. To cope, she over-medicated, taking three times the prescribed dose of the sleeping pill Nimbutal. The consequences of this prescription were calamitous. Feeling all alone, Monroe found a brief respite in the form of her co-star Clark Gable, who treated her with kindness and generosity. However, Gable's passing just days after the filming concluded left Monroe grief-stricken for an extended period. In an unsurprising turn of events on November 11, 1960, Miller and Monroe officially divorced. While this split might have signaled a fresh start for Monroe, unfortunately, her circumstances took a darker turn. In February 1961, a few months after the divorce, Monroe confided in her friend that she had contemplated ending her own life by jumping off her apartment balcony. Shortly after these suicidal thoughts surfaced, Monroe faced another profound low. Against her will, her psychoanalyst had her committed to a psychiatric ward. Monroe anticipated a place for rest and recovery, but instead, she found herself confined in a padded cell and threatened with a straitjacket. Monroe eventually detailed the inhumanity she experienced in a psychiatric ward, recounting instances where she felt treated as subhuman, until she was ultimately rescued by her ex-husband, Joe DiMaggio. Marilyn Monroe appears to have navigated two distinctly different lives. On one hand, she was portrayed as a struggling addict with quite the history, while the other depicted a glamorous movie star with a string of romantic entanglements, which reportedly helps her feel alive. That is why, through her deep depressive episodes, Monroe managed to fit in dates with Frank Sinatra and even pursued a relationship with the most famous man in America then, the president himself. In May of 1962, Monroe delivered a famously breathy rendition of Happy Birthday to President John F. Kennedy, sparking rumors of a mere intimate connection. Modern historians widely acknowledged a passionate affair between Kennedy and Monroe, leading to a dramatic confrontation between JFK's wife and the mistress. According to a recent book on Jackie Kennedy, Monroe claimed that JFK had promised to marry her. Jackie, however, remained composed, stating, Marilyn, that's great. You'll move into the White House and you'll assume the responsibilities of the First Lady and you'll have all the problems. Unsurprisingly, this scenario never materialized, but not for the expected reasons. Marilyn was supposedly harboring a secret. She wasn't only romantically involved with John F. Kennedy, but was also seeing his younger, more sensitive brother, Bobby Kennedy, simultaneously. It seemed Monroe had a penchant for brothers, reminiscent of her experiences with the Chaplin siblings back in the 1940s. Throughout the early 1960s, Monroe's mental health issues persisted. Her makeup artist disclosed that during particularly difficult moments, she couldn't bear to sit up, requiring makeup application while lying listless in bed. Nevertheless, even in the state, Monroe committed herself to work, signing on for Something's Got to Give, unaware that it would be her final film. In 1962, 20th Century Fox dismissed Marilyn Monroe from the production of Something's Got to Give due to chronic lateness and frequent absences. Despite these challenges, Monroe's star power remained evident as she promptly signed another contract with Fox. Regrettably, she would never complete another movie. Because on August 5, 1962, Marilyn Monroe's lifeless body was discovered at her Brentwood, California home. Found in her bed with a phone in hand, Monroe was just 36 years old. While the coroner's verdict leaned towards a probable overdose as a cause for death, certain details fueled speculation about the possibility of a darker fate. Some sources, including her former friend Marlon Brando, entertained the belief that she was the victim of foul play. Prominent among these theories are suggestions that Bobby Kennedy or the CIA orchestrated Monroe's death. 
In the case of Kennedy, the motive would be to prevent Marilyn from disclosing her affairs with him and his brother. However, as of 2020, these remain unproven conjectures rather than established facts. Some say it also could have been her obsessive ex, Joe DiMaggio. But apparently, DiMaggio's troubling episode of stalking had a transformative effect on him. DiMaggio confronted his personal demons and eventually became close friends with Monroe again. When she passed in 1962, he arranged her funeral, devastated by the unexpected turn of events. For two decades following Marilyn's death, Joe DiMaggio sent roses to her crypt three times a week, never remarrying and expressing that his last wish was to finally see Marilyn. The revelations and rumors about Marilyn Monroe's final years continued way after her death. Any memorabilia associated with Marilyn Monroe has fetched substantial sums at auctions. To this very day, Marilyn Monroe has a profound impact. With numerous impersonators, iconic fashion trends modeled after her, as well as different versions of her life story being portrayed on film. Marilyn Monroe's life was complex, and certainly adds to the allure of her mysterious seductress persona that was ended with harsh realities of fame and the weight of her personal battles. Marilyn Monroe remains an eternal muse, a symbol of beauty, strength, and the fragility of the pursuit of dreams. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like and hit the subscribe button if you want to hear more stories about your favorite old Hollywood stars.